Hello and welcome to the interview here on France 24. Our guest today is Janos Pastor, who was very recently appointed as the United Nations Assistant Secretary General on Climate Change with the task of shepherding a global deal on climate change in Paris at the end of the year. Mr. Pastor, thank you very much for coming on the France 24 set. Thank you. Obviously, uh, those talks are in full swing uh, as we are. The objective is a legally binding and global agreement that would limit carbon emissions to keep, uh, to keep global warming uh, below two degrees Celsius. Uh, this is obviously a very, very ambitious objective. Are we on track to reach it by the end of this year? We are on track uh, to reach an agreement. What, we will, what will be the content of the agreement is, of course, uh, going to be worked out during the course of the year. And that agreement has many different components. And uh, it's the totality of the package that will assure us uh, by the end of the year whether or not we're on that track to reach that two degree target that you talked about. But from all the discussions you're having around the world, do you sense uh, that there is a real willingness by the main actors to reach something that would really change the situation? There is a strong willingness just about everywhere to actually come to an agreement. Countries really want an agreement because we've been working at this for many years. As you know, there have been negotiations for many years and uh, there is a willingness. Uh, of course, not any agreement. It's important that the content of the agreement, that it be ambitious enough uh, in terms of what countries can bring to the table at this time, that is to say in Paris at the end of this year, but also that the agreement contains sufficient elements to make sure that whatever is brought to the, the agreement table in Paris can be reviewed and monitored to make sure that over time we continually improve uh, our response to climate change. How urgent is this agreement? Because we hear some uh, people saying, you know, it's five minutes to midnight. If we don't reach an agreement, it's the end of the world as we know it. I mean, how urgent is this? Is this an overstatement? Or is really Paris the last chance to really change that equation? The Secretary General has said that uh, our generation is the last generation that can actually do something about climate change. So it's in that sense, it is urgent. It is not that tomorrow we must finish all the work. No, we have some time, but we don't have a lot of time because climate is already changing. You can see it, you can measure it, you can feel it. To see what's happening in the Arctic, uh, the ice is thinning, look at the weather patterns across the world, look at the increase in, uh, uh, in hurricanes and, and uh, extreme weather events. So uh, the climate is changing and the longer we wait, the more difficult and the more expensive it will be uh, to do something about it. So in that sense it's urgent because if we don't do it today, yes, tomorrow we can stu it, still do it, but it will be more expensive and more difficult. So, uh, in the run-up to this uh, big Paris summit uh, in, in December, uh, countries uh, were supposed, by the end of March, uh, to give their uh, national contributions, what they would do in terms of uh, reducing uh, the emissions after 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, I think only 33 countries mm -hmm. uh, have done so, including uh, especially uh, the big bloc, the European uh, Union, we've seen Norway, we've seen Switzerland, and at the very last uh, minute, we've seen Russia as well and the United States. Is this for you an important signal? It's an important signal that we have these countries who have contributed their, uh, their, their commitments that they will bring to the table. Uh, we need more and there will be more. This was not a hard deadline that they had to finish by, uh, by the 31st of March. Uh, and uh, we know that the, a number of other countries are working on their uh, contributions and they will come. So uh, uh, over the, we are encouraging, of course, countries uh, to come forward as soon as possible. And we are encouraging them not just to come forward, but to come forward with ambitious plans. And uh, what the U.S. has announced, for example, they're saying they are planned uh, to cut emissions uh, between 26 to 28 percent by 2025 when you compare it to 2005 levels, is this ambitious enough to reach the goal that you have? Or do you want more from Washington? Okay, uh, I, I will not address now what we want specifically from each country. What is important to say is that 
it is very likely that the totality of what we will get from countries when you add it up is not going to be sufficient uh, to put us on a two degree path. That is what is the likely outcome of this. But that doesn't mean that it's a failure. What, it is, in, what is important to mention here is that the, the agreement will have to have a very strong mechanism of review and monitoring to make sure that the first step that we have in these commitments that countries are now being forward, that we can continually look at it, evaluate it, and as necessary, ratchet it up to make sure that the response eventually fits what science tells us. So what you're, what you're saying is if there is an agreement in Paris, maybe the uh, verification, the monitoring of the agreement is even more important because more will have to be done in yeah. the future. As I said at the beginning, it's a package of different elements that together will make Paris a success or not. And the level of commitment that countries bring is one. Another one is the, the way monitoring and evaluation will be looked at in the uh, agreement. And another one is how all that will lead us to a long-term goal of decarbonization, because we know that that's the direction that we have to go to. So, as uh, of this deadline, you said it wasn't a hard deadline. Mm -hmm. Some of the big polluters of the planet, uh, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Japan, have not said mm -hmm. uh, what they're going to do. This must be a little bit alarming for you to see that those countries uh, that are very important just in terms of uh, emissions mm -hmm. have not come forward. Mm -hmm. It's not alarming because we know that they're working on, on these uh, uh, commitments. So the, seriously? The work, yes, they're seriously working on them. Uh, I was recently in Japan, for example, with the Secretary General, and we've spoken with the senior leadership there, and, and we know they're working on their, uh, on their uh, papers. So it's not a question of not them not taking it seriously, but every country has domestic and other political economic challenges that they have to deal with. An important signal maybe was sent by the U.S. and China last November when they announced what the U.S. just confirmed, uh, that it would lower uh, its uh, gas emissions between 26 to 28 percent. China also made an announcement that uh, it was hoping that its emissions would peak by 2030, uh, which is probably encouraging, but also terribly vague. I mean, what does it mean? Is China really committed or is China saying, well, you know, we need to catch up economically. Why shouldn't we benefit from the dirty energy that the West used to take advantage? I'm sure that China would not have made that announcement where had they not been serious about it. So, uh, so my answer to you is yes, they are serious about it. And China has a very strong policy of going in that direction. Now, whether it's fast enough or fast enough from your perspective or from somebody else's perspective, that's part of the intergovernmental negotiations to figure out uh, whether we're actually uh, moving all to in the right direction at the right speed. But what is important to say is that the agreement between, Japan, uh, between uh, China and the United States was an important signal. It's, it was a very important signal because two major countries, two major polluters have agreed that they will move forward and they will do things that they can do at home with given their domestic, uh, political, economic and other requirements. Uh, do you think uh, that countries, uh, poor countries, uh, are confident that there will be an agreement? To, are they implicated enough in this process or would you want to see them more actively involved because they fear that you know, that they would be taken advantage mm -hmm. of like happened in the yeah. past. Poor countries are quite strongly involved and uh, some of them have grouped into uh, interest groups such as the least developed countries or the small island developing countries. They have very particular concerns because they haven't contributed much to their cumulative emission of greenhouse gases, so they haven't caused the problem, but at the same time they're being affected by it more than anybody else. Uh, because they are more, more vulnerable. Their socioeconomic and often geographical situation makes them more, more vulnerable. So yes, they are very active. Uh, Mr. Pastor, you were in the Copenhagen uh, talks that were deemed uh, a failure several years ago. You were closely involved in them. Why would Paris be different than Copenhagen? Well, uh, some people said it was a failure. Some, for some people, it was not a failure. There were, it wasn't a there were, success. There, but there were, some, there were some very important positive developments that came out of the Copenhagen Why is it going to be and different? And we should not forget about that. But, but I think that in terms of uh, the things that haven't worked so well in Copenhagen, we have learned from that. Uh, we collectively, the, 
the, the negotiation process, the, the importance of, uh, of uh, good communications between the different components, because there is a secretariat, there is the, the, the host country, there are the different negotiating groups, and we have learned much better, that's one thing, of how to, 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 to do these things. But also, the world has moved, and uh, uh, the world has moved quite a lot, the private sector in particular, there's been a tremendous change in the way private sector engages in this area. The, the revolution in, in, for example, solar technology. Five years ago, you would not have been able to say what is happening today. India, they're going to build 100 gigawatts of solar power in the next 15 years. It's incredible. And, and th these things have changed, and they put a different set of facts in front of the negotiators. So uh, that's why I said earlier that, yes, governments are ready, they really want an agreement, but they have been helped by all these changes to actually come to a conclusion. Yes, there will be some difficulties, there is uh, some time to work on those, but on the whole, these changes were positive and they make it more possible for governments to come to an agreement. Okay, thank you very much, Janusz Pastor, for answering our questions. Thank you very much for watching this interview here on France 24. Stay tuned for more news.